us care a great deal about the environment. At least over here in Europe. Back in my home country, they can be a little bit confused. <laughs> but here, we do tend to mostly care about the environment. And because we care about the environment, we like to think about whether there's something we could do about it, and whether there's something we can help with, aside from just thinking about it and talking about it. So we have individual actions that we do to try to consider the environment. And let me give you a couple of examples. So my first example is Earth Hour. Some of you may have heard of this. It's coming up in the next couple of weeks. It's a time when there's a coordinated shutdown where everyone turns off their lights, their electricity, and tries to preserve power for about an hour. And as I said, it happens in a coordinated way across the globe. So that people in your local city would all be doing it at the same time. And because of that, it does actually seem to have an effect. You can measure the decrease in power consumption because of the fact that everybody's turned their lights off. However, I had this realization a couple of years ago that there were a large number of people live tweeting Earth Hour. <laughs> so they were sitting with phones, with laptops, unplugged, running on battery power, but not thinking through what that meant about the fact that they were eventually going to have to plug those devices back in. And of course, there was also power to the servers and the websites that they were using to send these messages. Maybe not so effective. I'll give you another example. I, being a person who has to follow both football and soccer, end up flying across the Atlantic quite a bit. <laughs> because of this, I have a lot of air miles. And if you go to buy an airplane ticket these days, you find that there's often an option to offset your carbon footprint by paying a little bit of money. Now this raises some really interesting ethical questions about the fact that there's a question about whether it's you as the consumer or the airline who should be really thinking about the carbon miles. But there's also an issue of should you just be paying to assuage your own guilt? Now these examples that I've given are about individual actions. So maybe instead of thinking individually, we should be thinking collectively as a society about the things that we could do to help with reducing the carbon footprint. And that's where I think it's important to look at some of the maybe less obvious things that we could be doing. And the example that I want to give today is thinking about the materials that we use to build things. Maybe not something you've thought about before, but actually concrete and steel are two very large contributors to our global carbon footprint. How could that be? Why is that? Well, it's because they have to be processed at very high temperatures. And if something is being processed at high temperatures, you have to have a lot of power for the power plant to heat your kilns and your furnaces. And so therefore, if you actually look at a pie chart of the global carbon footprint, each of those two materials, concrete, and steel takes up a chunk that you would find surprising. And in fact, if you add those two together and compare them to the entire global airline industry, the materials are about three times the size of the carbon emissions from all of airfare. So that's good, I feel better. <laughs> now, if we want to think about that global carbon footprint of these materials, then we, as materials engineers, are the sorts of people to think about it. But I come from a little bit different background. I've actually been working in biomaterials and bioengineering, and actually um, did my PhD studying how bone heals around metal implants. So it's maybe not an obvious area for someone like me to be working on. But actually, it was at a materials research conference a number of years ago where I first heard about this. I was at the conference and there were lunchtime seminars that were supposed to be general interest. Um, and my real interest was that there was going to be free pizza. <laughs> so if you've ever attended an academic conference, you will know that they can be exhausting. And so the lure of free pizza was something I could not resist. 
and I figured I could listen to the talk, whoever it was. It was an environmental minister from Germany, and he was the one who put up these pie charts showing the global carbon footprint and showing how materials, which was the subject of the conference, could be playing such a significant effect. So that's the question, what can we do about that? So if we think about materials through history, we know that early man mostly used natural materials. Building shelters would have been using things like rocks, tree branches, things that were found in nature, maybe slightly processed, like something based out of clay bricks. Then we had the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution is when we became really, really addicted to concrete, particularly reinforced concrete and steel. So we had these materials that could do things that we could never have done before. We could build bridges that spanned very large bodies of water. We could build towers and skyscrapers and buildings that we had never considered previously. But we were doing so at the expense of our environment and we weren't really thinking about it. The engineering was very cool and so this sort of side effect of spending a lot of our carbon budget on materials didn't really truly come up for a long time. So we have this tradition of building with very carbon intensive materials. How can we innovate? How can we think to get away from that? Now as engineers, we can try to innovate by making it less carbon intensive to use these materials and to keep building the kind of cool things that we like to build. That is a process that's going on today. There are people working very hard on making more energy efficient furnaces so that you can continue to process concrete and steel, but do so in a way that uses less energy and is less bad for the environment. However, is that really innovation? If we truly want to innovate, doesn't that mean we have to do something radical and maybe a little bit different? That's where the theme of this conference is so interesting, jumping off the shoulders of giants. I have three examples of giants that I want to talk about, two from the past and one more contemporary. So in the past, there was Leonardo da Vinci, and da Vinci is very well known for his sketchbooks, and in his sketchbooks, there are some really interesting flying machines that he designed based on being inspired by the anatomy and the flight of birds. My second example from the history comes just after World War II. There was a professor at what happens to be my alma mater university, uh, the University of Minnesota. And this professor, Otto Schmidt, had a really unusual background. He had degrees in both physics and zoology. So he was an early 20th century pioneer in bioengineering, crossing this disciplinary divide. And he coined this term biomimetics, so literally copying nature. My third giant is Julian Vincent, who is a professor and has been one of my mentors as I've come up through my own career. And he and his group wrote a really seminal paper about the fact that nature and engineers just do things differently. Engineers, as we've seen, tend to throw energy at problems. Whereas nature doesn't use as much energy, but uses information. Well, information, biology, that's DNA. So in every one of your cells, depending on how you count it, and some of these estimates are a little bit dodgy, something around tens of gigabytes up to over, or tens of megabytes up to over a gigabyte of information. And what does that information do? Well, the information is there because you have the DNA, it gets translated into proteins. Proteins have many, many different functions, of which some of them are really as materials. And you might say, wait, materials? I thought we were talking about biology. But actually, if you look at something like bone, it's only 3% living cells and 97% non-living material. So don't think of bone 
just as a medical thing. Think of it as a structural thing. So if we want to mimic bone, we have to understand how it's made. And so we can look at that DNA gets uh, expressed as proteins, in particular the protein collagen, which is the most important structural protein in mammals. That collagen is stretchy and rubbery, so we need something to make it stiffer, and for that we have ions of calcium and phosphate floating through our system in our body fluids, and those combine and deposit directly on the collagen, and that's bone mineral. So you have a composite structure now where you have the protein and you have the mineral, each contributing different things, but when you put them together, you get materials that are stiff, strong, and tough, especially for their weight, which is relatively light. And this is a theme we see all throughout natural materials, that they tend to be composites, which engineers only kind of figured out in the 1980s when we started building really cool airplanes with composite materials. Nature's been doing it this whole time. Another example of a composite material that I'm really interested in is eggshell. So you have this membrane, which, oh, is also collagen, and it's full of the liquid innards of the egg, and that goes from soft and squishy to a hard, substantive egg in the chicken in only 18 hours. And you know that that's a mechanically robust system because you have to work really hard to get to your breakfast. <laughs> so we have these interesting materials, and the most revolutionary thing about them is actually the fact that they're made under near ambient conditions. So chicken temperature not being that different from room temperature, certainly not anything like what you have if you've got a high temperature furnace in order to process really high temperature materials such as concrete and steel. So we have an opportunity here. We can make materials, and we can make them in any shape we want. Remember the disadvantage of taking something like a piece of wood out of the forest is that the shape of it is whatever you get. You may have kinks in it, you may have changes in the cross section, there may be knots in the wood, you have no control over that. But if we make a nature mimicking material, like an artificial bone, an artificial eggshell, then you can control the shape of the thing that you make. In my lab, that's what we're doing right now. Those are the two materials we're working with. And I'm not gonna pretend like we've got it all figured out. Nature's pretty complicated. But we can actually make chunks of material that we can test and we can show that the chemistry and the physical properties are similar to what is found in nature to the materials that we're trying to copy. So here we have this great opportunity as a society. We can decide that we want to do something different in order to dramatically change the carbon footprint by just saying we're not going to use these materials that require high temperature processing and reformulate our building and construction industry in order to focus on materials that are inspired by nature. When we do that, we're really engineering things. And actually, that's a very important point. The base word of engineering is not engine, it's ingenuity.